Let's talk all about PCOS. Hi friends, PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome. You have so many questions about it and I'm gonna answer them. I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor and today we are gonna talk all about PCOS. So I see all your questions about PCOS anytime we ask for questions. Any video I do never answers all the questions. So we are going to answer some of the comments that you have asked, questions you have asked, on other videos and try to answer them for you. First off, before we dive in, just wanna say a huge thanks for your support in this channel as it's growing. It just warms my heart, I love it so much. I would love if you would subscribe and follow along. The more people who subscribe, the more people who share, the more our message of learning about your body, that it is something that you deserve, education information that you need, our message just spreads to more people. And I am just trying to provide fact-based concise evidence, full videos so that you can take these little tidbits of knowledge and then go on with your day. When we talk about PCOS, we've got to understand really quickly normal ovulation and then what PCOS is to get into these questions. So in the very fastest way possible, inside your ovary, I like you to imagine you have a vault where all your eggs are kept. When you're born, the vault is full. Throughout your life, eggs come out of the vault. Each month, you have a group of eggs that comes out of the vault each egg is in a follicle. The brain sends out follicle stimulating hormone or FSH, which works to stimulate an egg to grow. As that egg grows, matures, develops, that one will ovulate, the rest of them die, the next month another group, so on and so forth until you run out of eggs. Now, PCOS in its simplest is having a lot of eggs in the vault. What is happening then is that you're going to have more eggs available every month because the vault self-regulates. More eggs inside, more come out every month. Fewer eggs inside, fewer come out every month. That means if you have a high egg count number, your vault is going to send more out. The brain does not know and it sends out the same amount of FSH. But that signal is getting too dilute amongst all of those follicles. Therefore, it is not a strong enough signal to get one follicle itself to grow and to ovulate. And instead, you start to see a transition where the ovary gets bored because it's not making high estrogen unless it's ovulating an egg. It's still making some estrogen. Your baseline estrogen is higher in PCOS than the average person because each egg makes a tiny bit of estrogen. Double the amount of eggs, double the baseline estrogen. Lining can still grow in some ways, but the ovary's not chugging out that estrogen that it likes to be, and the ovary is a hormone-making factory. So it gets bored and the pathway from the brain to the ovary to make testosterone starts to become a real easy pathway. You then get testosterone production, can lead to insulin resistance, weight gain, mood changes, depression, fatigue. It can also then cause you to have hair growth and acne and these clinical signs of hyperandrogenism. When you diagnose PCOS, the diagnosis is made by two out of the three, at least right now, and these are called the Rotterdam criteria. One is having irregular or absent periods. Two is going to be a high egg count. Currently, this is based on ultrasound, although high AMH value will probably be in the diagnostic criteria soon. And three is going to be high androgens, so clinical or lab value. So you don't have to go get your blood checked if you have acne and irregular periods. Based on this definition, you have PCOS. So we are going to dive into your questions, trying to understand more about this disease. But before we do, I always say to my patients that PCOS, it's like a teeter-totter or a seesaw. There will be times of your life where things are better or things are worse. And it's very hard to be in perfect balance, for lack of a better word. When you have PCOS, your body is so sensitive to stress or to stressors. And so things like high cortisol, increased adrenal androgen production, they can also suppress the brain from sending out FSH and then further make the process worse. Same thing with gaining weight, having extra inflammation. So you really have to, if you have PCOS, step back, look at the whole picture of the whole body and treat it from multiple angles. Also, it is okay if you can't cure your PCOS or treat yourself naturally and into ovulation. You did not control how many eggs you were born with. You did not control if you have PCOS. It's an ovulation dysfunction, just like we don't blame ourselves for other endocrine disorders. Let's please let the blame go for this one and not think that you can always achieve 
cure or ovulation or normalcy or pregnancy based on a certain lifestyle program. But you can 100% make it worse or make it better. And so we're always about optimizing and giving you the control you can have. I just sometimes see people feeling like they're a failure because they didn't achieve this set goal. All right, we are going to dive into your PCOS questions now. I've heard that OPKs aren't helpful with PCOS, so does that mean when I get a positive OPK, I still might not ovulate? Very good question. And it depends. Each person is going to be different. Remember that an OPK is checking for that LH surge. It's looking for the first time your body's sending out a lot of LH. When that happens, it's going to trigger you to ovulate. Now, if you take OPKs and you're somebody with PCOS who has relatively regular periods and you have negative tests and then you get a positive, remember you should check that OPK around the same time every day between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and you wanna have it see it go from negative to positive. The day you get the positive is considered the day of the surge. Ovulation day is considered to be the next day and those would be the two days that you would wanna time intercourse if you're trying to get pregnant since sperm can live in the female reproductive tract longer than the egg lives. All right, however, back to part of the problem with PCOS is that if you are in the pathway where your body's making extra testosterone, your LH might be baseline really high. So sometimes people with PCOS get very abnormal OPK results because that's the same hormone the OPK is checking. So if you're getting positives really early on, positives in your follicular phase, then those are not going to be a reliable tool for you. The more irregular your period is, the more unreliable the test is going to be. Also remember that once you get a positive, you don't need to keep checking them, so don't waste your time on that. That said, I have some patients with PCOS who can use them. They do actually get a positive, so it is one of those trial and error things. A true positive, you should get your period two weeks later if you're not pregnant. So if you get a positive and then a period doesn't come three and a half weeks, that was not a positive. I was just diagnosed with PCOS based on elevated AMH and ultrasound. My question is, I have regular periods and regular ovulation that's been confirmed by blood work and ovulation tests. Would medications like letrozole still help me if I'm already ovulating on my own? So remember that PCOS trifecta, so you definitely can still be ovulatory and have PCOS. I like to think about it as your teeter-totter is pretty balanced right now, understanding it may switch. Typically, it means you're doing a good job of taking care of yourself and listening to your body. If you are ovulating, you're documenting ovulation, and your luteal phase is a normal length, 12 to 14 days without a lot of spotting, you probably don't need ovulation injection medications. That doesn't mean that your PCOS may not be playing a role. This is where things like inositol or metformin might actually be helpful because you still might have some underlying insulin resistance. It might just not be in the way that it is causing irregularity of your periods at this point. So remember that PCOS can impact our ability to get pregnant by failure to ovulate, insulin resistance, but also through inflammatory changes. So pay a lot of attention to your body, especially if you notice that you have food sensitivities. There's a large overlap with PCOS and vitamin D deficiency and thyroid disease. So make sure you've gotten a full evaluation. I went off birth control and quickly was diagnosed with PCOS. I was off the pill for nine months prior to a positive pregnancy test and then I miscarried at 11 weeks. I have yet to get pregnant again four months since my miscarriage. What do we know about PCOS and miscarriage and what next steps should I be taking? We know that you have a higher incidence of miscarriage if you have PCOS, probably due to the reasons stated above, problems with implantation due to ovulation disorder, maybe the progesterone isn't produced as well. We see higher rates of miscarriage when you have insulin resistance. and so. There are so many different factors at play with PCOS. One thing we know is that the longer it's been since you've been on birth control pills, the higher and higher your testosterone might be getting, and then that can start to play a role as well. That being said, four months isn't necessarily a long time, so it could be that it just hasn't been enough time. I've also seen patients, especially if you miscarried after 10 weeks, there can also be structural abnormalities. You can have scar tissue if you had to have a DNC. And so it might be worth getting an evaluation if your total length of time is just starting to add up and it might not make sense. I see a lot of patients with PCOS who have subtle ovulation abnormalities, luteal phase issues, they're just not really detecting, or they have concurrent hypothyroidism or other disorders that once we fix those can be helpful. Also remember, it's a very different world than when you got pregnant before when it comes to sperm. Sperm can really change every three months, so pay attention to your partner, 
what your partner's doing. I know toxins and things can cause sperm abnormalities such as marijuana use. Women whose partner used marijuana, even if the woman was not exposed to it at all, had higher rates of miscarriage. So I often see women really isolate themselves and view them as the only problem, but really we need to pull your partner into the mix too and make sure you guys are both getting an evaluation and doing as much as you can to drop toxin exposure and inflammation in general. All right, guys, well, these are just a top couple PCOS questions. We'd really love to answer more. So why don't you ask questions at the bottom of this episode and we will get to them in the comments or a follow-up Q&A. As always, you can get more information on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or follow along on the As Woman podcast. Thanks, friends.